so I could cry when you guys remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first, I've been here nine years. My name is Deborah Newhall. You see the back of me most often. You see who I have going. Um, I was hired by Lynn Cairns and was sad to see him go after being here just one year. But Martha told me that Rick had a voice, and a lovely voice, and he was a tenor. So I look forward to his arrival. <laughs> um, he probably had one of the nicest tenor voices for a choir. He knew how to fit in. He never wanted to be the star. He liked trying new music. He liked trying difficult music. He also liked having a good time in the choir. He might have been one of the best tenors I ever directed, but he wasn't the best behaved tenor. <laughs> he didn't always start the trouble, but he jumped right into the trouble. <laughs> and I think that was one of the things that he liked about choir, was that he could be one of the guys in the back and uh, not be the pastor. So. He was also a very faithful choir member. The only time he would miss choir was if Susan needed him, or if the church uh, needed him, or for a conference business, or for nationals games. <laughs> <laughs> he would miss choir. Those were the three things, Susan, the church, and the nationals. And I couldn't help but think on July 3rd that it was a terrible loss for the church but Rick got his curly up. For most of Rick's tenure here, I have served as the chairman of the church council. And uh, my background was a little different than his because when we had to make decisions, I would sometimes call for a vote. And Rick would say, we don't need a we don't need a vote. Rick's style was to build consensus. And he was a master of this. Whenever he had an idea, he proposed it in such a way that everybody would buy into it. <laughs> we still voted on the budget and we still voted on some personnel matters, but Rick had a style that was different. And it was very now, one of these meetings, at these meetings, we regularly would start off with reports from the ministry, the, from our uh, ordained ministers and from our uh, leader of our youth, and find out what they had in mind for the future. And then we hear the reports from the lay leadership, our lay leader, the chairman of the staff parish relations the trustees, and the finance team, and others who were there. And we'd all fit together. The idea was always a look to the future. And Rick's concern always repeatedly was, what can we do better? What should we introduce? What should we do to do? And it over and over this was a theme in our meeting. And one of the things which he introduced that would remind me of Rush has struck in my mind, was one he thought, when he started doing serums, sermon series, on the third Sunday, he would say he'd invite us back in here after the worship service, and he would sit on a stool like this, right here in the middle, and he'd say, now we're going to discuss things. You tell me what you thought about this the worship service. We have a discussion. And we could ask questions, we could make comments, and he would teach us his impression of what was there. Well, on occasion, later on, after one of these sessions, I had a chance to go up to him and I said, You know, these sessions where you sat and taught us here reminded me of Jesus sitting on the steps of the temple and teaching to the he looked at me and his eyes opened up and he said, thank you. And he, and, uh, he smiled and it reminded me of what we heard last week. 
It was all about Jesus. Yeah, we've all lost our pastor, but he was my friend. Um, a couple years ago when I had my mastectomy, I wake up and who's there? John is there and Rick is there. And that's how I um, But as the week goes on, you find that you're hearing that same thought from all kinds of different people. Now the district superintendent says, he was your pastor, he was my golf buddy. Or um, somebody else, the lady says, you know, we were on this sort of that committee at conference together, and he made it fun. You know, so he was everybody's friend. If you go over to their house right now, whose picture's on his fridge? Okay, there's there's Anna, his granddaughter. That's possible. But who else's picture is on his fridge? The kids that were just sitting here and standing here, their pictures are all over his fridge, and he was their friend too, and they felt the same way about him. So I got to thinking, how did he connect to so many people, so many very different people? I mean, these are all kinds of people that felt this way about him. And here's what I came up with. The first thing is, he had Susan. Um, he couldn't have been Rick the same way we knew Rick if he hadn't had Susan. Um, she is so welcoming and um, in gracefully inviting to people who come to our church. We've been blessed to have her. Just a few weeks ago, we were having lunch over here at one of the restaurants, and there was an older guy there who was by himself, and Susan's like, oh, he looks like maybe he could do some company. She invites him to eat with us. We had a marvelous conversation. And she was like that every week at our church, inviting the new people that, oh, here's the food, you know, come talk. Um, and she runs our prayer chain, and um, she hosts us every week for hot dogs and volleyball, and I can't even begin to list the things that she does. So I wanted to say thank you. You are awesome. Thank you. Well, <laughs> okay, the, the second thing I came up with is he really did accept people as they are. You did not have to be super Christian in front of Rick. You know, he got that people had doubts. He didn't mind if you asked him really hard questions. You know, I asked him some very gnarly questions the last two years, believe me. And uh, he never said, oh, you shouldn't feel like that. Or he never gave you easy answers. Um, he took those as conversation starters, you know. As a result, uh, I think people felt very, very comfortable with him. He did not deal with platitudes ever. You can say, okay, Rick, why does an eight-year-old kid at our school get liver cancer and die really horribly? And he doesn't come out with any of this nonsense, oh, you know, her work here was done, or um, my favorite, God needed another angel in heaven. He didn't do that. He knew that if God needed an angel in heaven, he could talk to any of the rocks in the parking lot and say, I need an angel, get up, be an angel, and the rocks will listen. Rick didn't do that stuff. The third thing I came up with is he was like a little kid. Did you ever see him at transportation day with a fire truck? <laughs> <laughs> or a model railroad? Or a really good glass of beer? Um, just recently, one of his kids gave him a present where they could all go. Rick and his kids went to a proper craft brewery in Frederick and used professional equipment to make their own beer. And it came out really good. And um, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, at Susan's house, we're there for volleyball and hot dogs, and it started pouring rain down right in the house. And Rick pulled out some of this beer that he made, and it was really good. <laughs> but he's like delighted with it. He's like, look at the color of this beer. Oh, just look at the head on that beer. <laughs> it was just so much beer to get it. You know, that, that kind of thing is contagious. But um, Jesus said we should be like little children. In my cynical days, I used to think, well, what does that mean? Be like little children? Does that mean uninformed or, or gullible or, you know, easily manipulated into believing fairy tales? 
Um, he wasn't like that. He was, I think the word is open-minded. He was open to possibilities. He would let you try new things. He would let you sing Godly song in church, you know? Um, he would let me say, I, I, I went to him one day and said, Rick, I had a vision. I know what we gotta do. He said, what do we gotta do? I said, what we gotta do is the Harlem Shake. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't, you know, he didn't roll his eyes at me, he didn't say, well, this is, you know, this is pretty out there even for you. He just said, how can I help? You know, let's do it. And it turned out to be fun. Um, he also, I'm not trying to make him sound like a Pollyanna, he wasn't. He understood that there was evil in the world, and that's where our doubts come from. Um, he talked often about something terrible that happened in 1999. He, he um, had to preside at a funeral of two little kids who had been shot by their dad in their car seats. One of them was two and one of them was three. And he had to do the funeral. And um, that stayed with him forever. But it did make him all bitter and twisted. It made him a good listener and appreciative of you know, why we might wonder about evil in a world run by a living God. <clears throat> okay, the last thing I wanted to say was, he put his money where his mouth is. He didn't just talk it, he did it. And, um, you know, I could hear a story on the radio that some uh, immigrant workers had been moved along from where they gathered to get day jobs over here. And I'd hear the story on the radio, and I'd think, oh, that's a shame. Rick would hear that same story, and he would get up at 6 in the morning, buy donuts, and take them over there and talk to those guys. You know, he just did it. He didn't think about it. He did it. My favorite example of that, he really stuck it on the line. He, um, in January, when the state of Maryland legalized gay, gay marriage, it put Rick between a rock and a hard place because the Book of Discipline says you have to provide certain services for your people, marriages, baptisms, that kind of thing. But it also said you could do that if they were gay. And then somebody asked him to perform a same-sex marriage. And so he had to decide, what do I do? And he knew that if he did it, he could lose his job and everything that went with it. And they counted the cost and they thought about it. He said, either way, I'm going to be doing something that the Book of Discipline says I can't do. So I'm going to err on the side of love. And he didn't do it here. He did it in his own living room. You know, and he knew what he was doing. And it gave him such joy that was amazing to see. He made me want to go out and, and put it on the line. So, um, I do want to invite you all. One of the things he did that was kind of out there and open-minded was he started a group called God and Guinness, which is just a small group, basically, that meets at Growlers every two weeks. And um, we sit around. Some people eat dinner. Some people have a beer. Some people don't. But we talk. And I've gotten to know quite a few people in the congregation who came to that group. And he had already announced that it was meeting tomorrow, but he had to put out a topic. Usually there's a topic, which sometimes we actually talk about it, other times we talk about the nationals instead. Um, he hadn't put out the topic, so I'm putting out the topic. The meeting tomorrow night in Browlers, 7 to 9 o'clock, everybody's invited, and the topic is Rick. <laughs> and uh, bring your stories and any crowd moments you might have seen in the last week, even with all the sadness. A um, couple of memories I have. I think one thing I know working on staff, I share a lot of some of Martha shared, but um, one thing, Rick was brutally honest, and I mean that in a good way. Um, <laughs> you know, we might do something on lightning, and he kind of looked at me like, okay, that didn't work, did it? And he asked me it in like a form of question. I, I, I'd agree because I'd be always thinking the same thing, and sometimes I'd have to say it first, or just something I might have done. Like, or that music that you guys played, it wasn't, the band wasn't on that day, were they? Um, so things like that. It was always things I was thinking, but it was a honesty that ch definitely challenged me professionally. Um, and one other, a couple others are the things we were passionate about. Um, his granddaughter and Noah are about the same age, so he was very passionate about um, his granddaughter 
and he uh, he loved it. I think it kind of annoyed him sometimes. We know we're just running to his office on Sunday mornings. I know he's near the church. Um, <laughs> we'd run in there, and he's trying to robe up, or he's talking to somebody. And Noah's running around his office, and saying, "What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that?" You know, but he's only made time to say hi. Um, his other passion, I remember, we could talk about was the Nationals, um, baseball in general, and things like that, which was a great way to distract us from the duties of the day or the workday. Um, <laughs> I think the last passion we share, um, it's been mentioned about the kids and the youth. We both shared a passion for youth, and he spent a lot of time um, participating in things they did, um, going to their sporting events and things like that. He went to ASB. He also, last time we were in Manassas, came down to the mid-high trip, and just the way he talked about the youth and what they did and encouraged me um, and encouraged a lot of them and wanted to spend time with them. So that's one thing I remember. mother with the oldest child. <laughs> I thought that was very, um, uh, what's the word? Um, well, it was very tactful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was the first one that he handed a flower to. And it was a big red Gerber daisy with four big blooms on it. And usually, if you don't go out and plant those right away, they, they fade away. But I put this little flower into my bedroom so I'd remember to water it. And every morning when I got up, this whole week, or ever since, well, for months, um, but this week particularly, when I looked at, the, at that flower the first thing in the morning, it seemed to be telling me not to be sad that he was still here among us. But that little flower, I mean, it was given to me the first of, well, I, you know, on Mother's Day, that was May, a couple of months ago. Well, it's on its third blooming, and it's got, it's got five blooms on it, and one little bud coming yet. But he, it just seemed, he seemed to be speaking to me that flower telling me to, to not be sad because he was still here among us. His spirit was still here among us. I have also got a flower on Mother's Day, and I think his word gave it to me because he was crazy for having six children. <laughs> um, a lot of people have talked about um, Rick's ability to connect, and particularly his ability to connect with youth. So I'm going to tell a story about this, that illustrates this. And Adrian and I apologize in advance if I embarrass you. <laughs> so when we were looking at joining the church about, I guess, six years ago now, my mother found the church first. And I started to come, and she said, you know, I really think you should join this church. This is it. This is the church. And I said, well, Mom, you know, I, I think I, I've got to get the kids' opinion. The kids have to win. So the children came to Bible school. And that did it for most of them. Except my oldest, I'm sorry. <laughs> he and Adrian were, they were in, but it was still a little tempting. And my oldest son, by nature, is a little skeptical, so that's part of the course. At that time, I think they were in second and fourth grade, and their favorite movie was The Blue Brothers. They loved it. We watched it all the time. One day, I came out of the fellowship hall, and Rick was having a conversation with my two oldest sons. And it was in depth. And I walked up, interrupted them, and said, oh, what are you talking about? And Rick said, we're talking about my tie. And I looked down, and he's wearing his Blues Brothers ties, and I believe one of his sons gave to him. And I didn't really think anything of it. And we left church, and we went home. Well, the next Saturday night, excuse me, we were watching the Blues Brothers, as we did every weekend. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember this or not, Adrian, but all of a sudden, Adrian and Alex start talking about God and how, you know, there's all these messages about God in the Blues Brothers. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I'm also thinking I'm a bad parent because I never really brought that up before. I was talking about the cars and what years they were and wasn't that a cool car crash. So the next day we're driving to church 
And as we're driving to church, my oldest son says, you know, I don't think that this is such a bad place. And I think that we should become members of this church. And I was like, okay. And then, as I thought back to the conversation we had during the Blues Brothers movie the night before, I thought to myself, you know what, Alex? I think you're right. So an example of how Rick can act. I have a couple of notes. Sorry about the part of just to follow up what Bill just said regarding he was always planting new ideas here and trying new things and what Howard said earlier where he said um, that uh, he would incorporate media. I remember some great sermon series on the topic of movies. But uh, what I want to touch on here was that uh, he was always trying to strive to make this a church that reached out not only to those who were here, those that are booked, but to the community at large, those that aren't here yet. And um, he was casting his net far and wide, God and Guinness, Katie just told us about. But he was also especially interested in a contemporary cafe style worship that they piloted. And I don't know if Samson's here today, but it's special. especially Samson was uh, very involved with that. With, right? And they tested the waters, and remember it was uh, Sunday 633 service, which is Matthew 633's verse. Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In the end of that trial, in, in April, I believe, um, he, he, uh, he and Samson felt that the trial had run its course and that we weren't going to um, move forward with that, but he, um, he didn't have any concern about this in terms of just was, he was uh, dropping seeds everywhere, trying to find out which ones were going to grow, and that was, a, that was something about Rick that I really appreciated. Another thought I have is um, a little personal, but uh, just want to share. Since since moving my family to Maryland, um, uh, there have been uh, men whose views of the world I've uh, come to digest and, and really appreciate because the men's group, the Wednesday morning men's group, is something that uh, I really look forward to. And and Rick was there amongst us, and um, in that setting, he's not just the preacher; he's he's just one of us, and uh, he could let his hair down and. And things that are said in that room stay in that room. And, um, it was it was really neat to see this side of Rick that um, I, I hadn't seen before in, in a preacher. And uh, there's also um, um, someone else in my family who, who died of a massive heart attack, and, and it's uh, it's taking some getting used to. But um, uh, in a time span of three weeks, uh, when my my stepdad died of a massive heart attack, and then for Rick to have this occur, it takes some getting used to. But Having lost them, I, I know each of them would want me to continue in the faith and move forward as a doer of good works and be a part of this world and be a stronger Christian. And I just want to share. And the last thing I want to share is, um, as we look at this new world and that, that we in the Mill Creek Parish are living in, I reminded a girl that uh, three weeks ago, Reverend Rick was here and, and he was sharing with us his views on the changing face of those who are called to be ministers in, in our religion. And, and what he said was, and it, it kind of struck a chill uh, down my spine, he said something like, the next minister of this church isn't going to look like me, a good-looking white village man. <laughs> <laughs> because I know uh, the love that we have for the family of this church. I know he wasn't planning on leaving. And I also signed the paperwork that um, the conference needs that the staff relations committee approved his uh, Call for the next year, so I knew it wasn't that. So I just, uh, I just didn't know where he's coming from, and, and I just kind of called that um, he was telling us and teaching us and um, uh, letting us know that um, things are always changing and, and we should just be ready for it. And that was part of his teaching. I always noticed and, and, uh, that in every uh, church service, when he, when he comes in, he only says, I'm one of the ministers at Mill Creek Parish. And I always think to myself, Rick, tell him you're the head <laughs> <laughs> But he was, that just showed his humility. <laughs> This isn't really a remembrance, but um, 
My son got married here um, last year with his wife, Allie, and uh, they're moving to Philadelphia. He's going back to school, and uh, they, uh, they've been trying to find a place to live up there for several months, and uh, she's trying to find employment in Philadelphia, so it's been very stressful. Uh, over the last couple of months. Uh, and coincidentally, on Thursday, um, they got news that they got the apartment that they really wanted, and that her uh, position got transferred up there to Philadelphia. So it was a real joy. And I was just thinking that maybe Rick is up there pulling strings. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think maybe we have an agent up there now who's going to be pulling strings for all of us. I can speak about many ways that Rick touched my life because I know that everybody sitting here could. But I want to just speak about one that I thought about when the children were up with Martha. On Wednesday nights when I arrived to choir, to be the chair of choir, Rick was always here. He opened up the church, and no matter what kind of day I had, how tired I was, there he was with a smile. And he greeted me when he came in the door, and I was raring to go after seeing his face. And I know that he stood at that door, and he greeted the families and the kids that came in every week until he had to go and leave, probably in disciple Bible study. He was there greeting those families so that they felt welcome. Sometimes he hung around for a few minutes and watched our choir and the joy that was on his face. I could see it. Nobody else could see it, but the kids were all in front of me and he was over there and he was just enraptured by our little, you know, if you're happy, if God loves you, you know it or whatever. And sometimes he would come to the front of the choir and, and say, you know, sing me what you're working on. And we'd give him a little preview of what was coming up for Sunday. So I don't know who will be there at that door on Wednesday evenings this fall, but I'll sure remember and go in with a smile thinking of him there. I think we have time for one more and then we can continue this in the fellowship hall. Um, 
I don't know how many of you know this, but Rick and I got in the chat room on AOL. And over our years at AOL, on, through this chat room and all of our friendships there, he's done 12 weddings, and he did eight funerals. And he was really kind of the AOL, this particular chat room chaplain, which was a role that was also highly unpaid, but was kind of special to him. But you need to know this little thing about him. You're talking about children and all of us, how much you like children. And some of you don't know this, you know, except for from the pulpit. But his screen name on AOL is represented in this tie. And it's really the guy that I started to fall in love with. And his screen name was Waskly Wabble. 